I want to say a good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Good morning, good morning, and I want to look into the camera. I know uh, there's a number of you who are at home uh, joining us from there. I just want to say welcome to you as well. You're also significant and accepted and part of us, even though you're not here with us. So uh, anyway, here we are. Um, let me see here. I have our entire lead team is out today, believe it or not. Uh, Mike and Andy are on the men from COVID. Nathan and Stacy are on the men from COVID. I think Meg's traveling, but anyway. Um, so I come with an important message from them today and from an important message from our trustees. Are you ready? We know where we're going next. <laughs> so uh, it's actually a lot of good news, uh, believe it or not. Um, but there was a, um, there's a church that has operated in this city for 33 or 35 years called the Rock Church. And they have a neat little space off of Randall. It's actually not little. It's bigger than this whole facility. Um, and uh, we are going to be taking over that lease. So we've just signed a five-year lease. It's off of Randall Parkway over near UNCW. Um, however, the auditorium is not big enough for us. Uh, this auditorium, you may, it seems a little light this morning, I think with COVID and with uh, the cold, but this auditorium isn't big enough for us. So what we've decided to do is we are going to meet Sunday mornings at Roland Grice. And then we have this little office space. It's really not little, I guess, but we have this office space that'll be kind of like our permanent base. So middle school ministry, high school ministry will happen there. We're launching a Celebrate Recovery that'll happen over there. Men's ministry, women's ministry, there'll probably be a worship night over there. We'll probably launch an evening service over there at some point. So lots happening. It's a great space. Um, a ton of, I think, just really good things sort of unfolding there. We've also uh, have contracted with a group who is... Um, I guess they specialize in mobile church. So we started this gathering in our living room in like August of 18. Wayne and Sally were actually there early on. I think it was August. Um, and uh, we have sort of done it uh, all backwards, all wrong. And anything you're supposed to do when planning a church, we've done the exact opposite. So, but what we've done at this point is we've gone, okay, we're going to bring in somebody who's a little smarter than we are, and we're going to have them help us upgrade into mobile. Okay, so it's not going to be a downgrade. They're working on some trailers and some setups, and they came in and did inventory of everything we have, and they're going to help us transition into that. Sound good? All right, let's praise Jesus for a next place to go. Come on. Okay, um, I didn't intend to do this today, but Adrian is sitting right here. Adrian, um, we are going to get Adrian up here and pray for her and commission her at some point, but she is taking over our kids' ministry. Wave at us, Adrian. Come on. I've met with her a few times. We know her and Matt very, very well, and uh, we are so excited. In fact, as I've met with her, I'm ready to like go back and help with kids' ministry. So if I disappear, you're going to know where I am, okay? All right, so uh, we are in John 1, um, and we are going to do kind of what I love to do, which is see if we can get me out of the way and see if the Holy Spirit will show up and speak to us. See if the Lord Jesus will speak to us in and through the word. Yeah? Okay, so we're going to um, take a look. We're going to try to finish John 1. We're going to start in verse 35. We're going to go through verse 50. And we're going to look at uh, a concept that I'm just going to call the divine initiative and then our response. Um, then we're going to look at Andrew, really interesting disciple, because he's always sharing the glory. We'll come back to that one. And then we're going to take a look at uh, Jesus, the God who sees both the actualities of our life and the possibilities of our life. And then we're going to take a last look at the surrender of Nathaniel, all in this little section. And I'm going to take my jacket off. So here we go. I'm going to do that while I roll my sleeves. I guess I should have done this before I got up here. All right, John 1, we're going to start in verse 35, and here is what it says. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Now, quick review. What John are we talking about? John the baptizer. John the dunker. That's exactly right. 
So the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, this really isn't the essence of where we're heading, but I think it's important here. Because when, you say, when we say lamb in America, what do we think of? A little cuddly critter that we can hold, right? About yay big that you could pet and like, yay, a little, you know, fuzzy little thing. That's not what a lamb is really meaning here in this case. In this case, you're talking about a fully grown lamb, one to three years old, in its prime, probably with big horns, probably like a hundred pounder. Like this is a significant animal. This isn't a cuddly little thing that you can hold. If you're holding it, you're going to get, you know, knocked over in your chair. So there you go. Look, the lamb of God. Verse 37, when the two disciples heard, now who's, who disciples, which disciples are these two? John the Baptist. That's right. Does Jesus have any disciples yet? Not yet, but we're about to experience that. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now, I want you to get something here for just a minute because I think it's really, really powerful. Once again, we're seeing John the Baptist pointing beyond himself. All right? So if John wanted to keep his disciples and retain them, like most pastors want to retain people that sit in their congregation, do you think he's going to stand up and go, look at this guy who's coming down the street? Okay, so the moment he begins to go, hey, check out this Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. What is he inviting his disciples to do? Upgrade and transfer their loyalty from him to Jesus. I mean, for a young man of 30 years old, give or take, to grasp his insignificance and Jesus' significance is mind-blowing to me. the, The two disciples hear him say this, and they followed Jesus. And then, verse 38, Jesus does what is so characteristically Jesus. Turning around, Jesus said to them, following, and asked, what do you want? Okay, let's, let's pause here for just a minute. Um, I imagine that these two disciples have come up behind Jesus, and they're probably following behind from 30 yards or 50 yards or maybe even further. So they're, they're tracking behind him. Perhaps they're shy. Perhaps they're embarrassed. Perhaps they're just not really sure what to do, and so they're just walking along. They've responded at some level in their hearts, and what's Jesus do? Stops everything and turns around. I mean, I love this because this is so characteristic of this God who is always watching, who is always uh, waiting, who is always looking. This is the Luke 15, the prodigal father on the porch who is waiting for the son to show up on the horizon. And the moment he shows up, what's the father do? Runs to him. So the moment you have these two uh, disciples of John who are coming along behind Jesus, Jesus stops everything and he turns towards them. So I would actually say here, this is divine initiative. In other words, um, how many of you know that we don't love God because the love was in us first? Rather, we love God because he loved us first. And as he loves us, we're then able to turn our attention and focus towards him. And as we as people turn our attention and focus towards him, you always get this loving father who stops and turns around to shift his focus and attention to us. It is the God of the Bible. It is the only religion. I I hate the word religion. I don't like religion. Um, I don't think Christianity is a religion. I think it's a relationship. But for this statement, I'm going to say this. It is the only religion on earth where you have the divine initiative of a holy God coming to earth, pursuing his people, chasing after his people, looking for his people, giving it all for his people, paying everything on a cross, dying, breaking the bounds of death and hell, so that the moment we have, as his kids, looked towards him, what does he do? Stops everything and turns around. That's this God. That's this God. And this God is worth surrendering it all to and following. Because he's the one that as we shift our gaze, wherever you are, I don't care what kind of mess you're in today. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how dark you've sunken. It doesn't make any difference. The moment you stop looking and obsessing over your thing and your deal and you shift your gaze onto King Jesus, he will stop and turn around and engage you. And begin the process of redeeming and restoring and lifting you out and setting your feet upon the rock. That is the gospel from Genesis to Revelation right here in this divine initiation. So do I think for a minute that these two disciples of John um, started this initiation in and of themselves? No. 
No, God actually started it. But the moment they responded, you have Jesus turning around. So powerful, such a beautiful picture. And then I love this because verse 38, it says, turning around, Jesus saw them following, and then he asked, what do you want? In other words, what are you looking for? And if there's a question you could walk out of here today, if there's a question that I would even let the Holy Spirit sift my own heart on is, what do you want? What are you looking for? If we put it in Jesus' day, he's probably peering into their eyes as, as these two gentlemen are following behind him, and he's looking at them going, are you an ambitious couple of guys, sort of like the Sadducees, the religious people of the day? Or are you trying to look for power or prestige? Or are you like the Pharisees? Do you want to argue about the finer points of theology? Or Maybe you're like one of the zealots of the day who uh, wants to see the Messiah come and overthrow Rome, and you're ready to take up arms and build an army. Or maybe you're a broken person, and you just need to find peace and grace with God. But Jesus looks at them, and he says, what do you want? What are you looking for? I think we should probably all ask that same question periodically. Let the Holy Spirit sift your heart. What are you looking for? What are you about? What is going on? Are you looking for a career? Are you looking for security? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for a new house or a spouse or a roommate or a friend? What are you actually looking for? And I think what's so powerful is what these guys say back. This is so interesting. So turning around, so paint the picture. Jesus is moving. He's ministering with crowds. There's people around him. He's heading one way. These two guys following behind him. He stops everything and acknowledges these two guys. And then he says, what do you want? And they look at him and say, rabbi. Um, so this is a huge uh, statement of honor and respect. This is like there is nothing more... They couldn't, they couldn't have said anything in this moment with, uh, that would have um, sort of projected greater respect towards Jesus. But they, they ask or they respond to his question, what do you want? Instead of answering, what do they say? Isn't that weird? Tony's laughing. Tony looks at me and says, Michael, what do you want? And I say, where are you staying? It's kind of weird, right? We're so afraid to look at scripture and go, what in the world? Let me tell you what these guys are saying here because it's so powerful. It is so powerful. They're actually, <laughs> when they say, um, where are you staying? Father, let us get this. What they are saying is, Rabbi, we see something about you and we don't want anything but you. In other words, we don't want to have a casual conversation on the road. No, no, no. We're not interested in just having a cup of coffee. No, no. We're not interested in just saying hi to you and meeting you here in front of all these people. No, no. We want to actually go with you to where you're staying. In other words, we want to journey with you. We want to walk with you. We want to know you. We want to be your disciples. We want to follow you. We will go with you anywhere. Just tell us where you're staying. So what's indicative in this response is this powerful, like, I'll go anywhere, I'll follow any, anything, I will do anything to respond to this love, this purpose that I sense that you have. It, it reminds me, I don't know if I can find it here in my notes, but it reminds me of Ruth 1. Let's see if I can find it. When Ruth responds to Naomi and she says, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. In other words, we want relationship with you. We want a journey with you. And if I could call us to anything as a church, if I could even say the capital C church across America, even around the world, if we're missing an element of something right now, it's that this isn't about another service or another gathering or how good worship was or whether you like my preaching or my shirt. What matters is, are you in a deep and significant and authentic relationship with King Jesus? In other words, do you walk out of here and you go, Jesus, where are you staying? Because I want to go there too. That is the essence of Christianity. It's what it is all boiled down. And if we could do anything here at Saltbox, I would clear out absolutely everything and say, just Jesus. 
just Jesus. I don't care about anything else. And if we could call a group of people to become something and to do something and to go somewhere, it would be a group of people that would rise up and go, Lord, where are you staying? Because we're going to go. And if I could call us even as a people to be anything, it would be that we would be people that are increasingly quiet and increasingly listening and watching for the gracious hand of God because it is always moving in your life and in my life. The problem is not that God's not moving. The problem is that you and I aren't watching, that we're not listening, or that we disagree with the way he's moving. I don't like what you're doing. See, that's what Jesus was even testing these guys. What do you want? Are you a couple zealots that want me to rise up on a chariot and go conquer Rome? It isn't going to happen. Jesus is, is like, you know, there's no bait and switch here. He's just telling it like it is. And these guys respond with, Rabbi, where are you staying? Let's keep going. Jesus responds. So again, what do you want? Their response, where are you staying? Jesus' response, come, and you will see. In other words, Jesus recognizes this heart posture in both of these guys, and he invites them into the next phase of the journey. He invites them to come uh, with him. In fact, you hear me say a lot of times up here, get in the Jesus journey. Why a one-year Bible? Why a five-year journal? Why significant relationship with people? Because you are in a Jesus journey, and if you're not... You want to get into one because that's the transformation. It's where hope is found and life is found and grace is found and blessing is found. It is so, it is the richness of the gospel of Christ Jesus. But it's found in this journey, in this following after this Jesus. Come and see. Verse 39. So they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent the day with him. This next thing is so weird to me. It was about four in the afternoon. Isn't that weird? Like what, they, the Apostle John, I, if you were here a couple weeks ago, I said, I think the Apostle John is um, reciting all of this. It's almost, uh, it's almost 70 years after he walked with Jesus. And he's reciting all this because he can't uh, write anymore, most likely. He's nearing 100 years old. And John the Elder is capturing it. And so he's, he's sitting there and vision John the Apostle sitting with a group of people in Ephesus. And they're capturing this, this gospel of John. And so he's telling this story. And then he says, it was about four in the afternoon. What? Here's what I think, and I can't prove it to you, but it is what I think. I think John the Beloved was one of these two guys. And I think he's saying in that moment, I remember the rocks on the ground. I remember the weather. I remember the time of day. I remember because Jesus came and he changed everything. And I started following him and everything shifted in that moment. It was four in the afternoon. If you think back when the two towers, the twin towers exploded, were attacked in Manhattan, I can remember where I was. I could take you there right now. Where I was, I could tell you what I was wearing, what my hair looked like. I actually had some. Uh, I, I could tell you my, the shoes I had on. I can remember every little thing. The generation that lived when uh, when JFK was shot, some of us who remember when the Challenger blew up, you can remember these things, and you, it's like it's permanently branded in some ways on your heart. And I think what John is saying here in this moment is, I was one of those guys, and I was following from a distance, and I was shy, and I was embarrassed, and I wasn't really sure, but I wanted a relationship with Jesus. And it was in that moment that he looked at me, and he said, hey, come on. And it was four in the afternoon. Everything changed for John right there. Everything shifted. And John begins to walk with the creator. Okay, verse 40. Here we go. This is, so we're, we're shifting from um, uh, the divine initiative and our response. So the divine initiative is Jesus uh, or God. Jesus is God, but it initiates in our lives, and you get to see how two disciples um, respond. So a question you can sort of sift or let the Holy Spirit sift in your own heart is, what do you want? Why are you here? 
What do you want out of life? What do you want out of Jesus? And now we're going to shift, and I want to talk about Andrew a second, because he's one of my, um, I think he's one of the most unsung heroes of the disciples. Let's look at him. Verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, we hear a lot about Peter, right? Yeah? Great guy. Loud mouth. Okay. Andrew... Simon Peter's brother. How much do y'all know about Andrew? We don't know much, do we? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon. Simon who? Simon Peter, that's right. And tell him, we have found the Messiah. Like, Andrew got it. Andrew might be the first person that gets it. Andrew is arguably the first, at least the first of two, who, who identify Jesus as the Messiah. So Messiah is like, in, in old Hebrew, it means anointed um, king. So it's, it's like uh, this, he, he is identifying Jesus as the anointed king, the promised anointed king from the Old Testament. And then it goes on, that is the Christ. And then he brought him, who's him? Peter, to Jesus. Okay, so we have found the Messiah, and he brought Peter to Jesus. Is it? I haven't seen the chosen, but I hear I need to. I'm <laughs> okay, so Jesus uh, looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. Now, let's pause here and just back up just a second. So Andrew, uh, let, me, let me tell you something funny about Abby and I. This is my wife, Abby, right here. Um, occasionally, she and I will get in a little fuss over who gets credit for an idea. You believe that? That happens at our house. I'm like, uh-uh, it was me. Y'all don't believe me, do you? I'm a thoroughly normal blockhead that has to go, oh, Jesus, help me. <laughs> you are too, and if you don't think you are, you're lying through your teeth. Okay. There's a, um, there's a thing in each of us that rises up, and we want credit, don't we? We want to be recognized. We want to know and let other people know that we got it together and we know what we're doing, right? So you have Andrew here, who what, is Andrew just dis what has Andrew just discovered? The Messiah. And who introduces Peter to the Messiah? Andrew. Now let's just unfurl a couple things here. In the Garden of Gethsemane, was Andrew there? Oh, man. Peter, James, and John. Oh, Andrew, Mount of Transfiguration, who was there? Peter, James, and John. Was Andrew there? Oh. When Jesus went and healed Jairus' daughter, who was there? Peter, James, and John. Was Andrew there? Can you imagine the temptation in Andrew to want to rise up and look at Jesus and say, but I found you first. I found you first. To want to take credit, to want to hog the glory, to want to say, oh, it was me. It was me. And yet not once do we see any indication of anything in Scripture other than Andrew being willing to share the glory, to step out of the limelight. In fact, there's a, there, I think one of the two remarkable things about Andrew is, number one, he's always prepared to take second place, and it would appear that he's always in Peter's shadow. Again and again and again, he's not even identified as Andrew. You know what he's called? Peter's brother. Andrew's always bringing somebody to Jesus. He brings Simon Peter to Jesus. You remember where Jesus fed the multitude and the little guy showed up with loaves and fish? You know who brought him? Andrew. There were a couple Greeks in John 12, if you want to look that up, that were brought to Jesus. You know who brought him? Andrew. There's never a sermon recorded from Andrew. There's nothing particularly great 
that is said about Andrew, but Andrew strikes me as someone who is consistently bringing other people to Jesus and is willing to lead them to the Savior and then to step out of the limelight and go, not my will, but your will. And I tell you what, that's a a cup that if the Holy Spirit sifts my heart under, I don't know that I always stand up. Are we as a people willing to lead other people to Jesus and then back out and not try to get the credit. Not try to say it was me. I was right, Abby. Come on, make this practical. If you're not offended, let me work a little harder. I love that Andrew's greatest sermons are simply leading people to Jesus. Some of you are an Andrew. Some of us are an Andrew. Oh, that we could all be a little more like Andrew. Okay, let's keep going. So I'm looking at the latter half. Let's just pick up in verse 42. And he brought him, who's him? Peter, that's right. So Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Now Jesus looked at him, Peter, and said, You are Simon, son of John. And then what's Jesus do? changes his name. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Okay, so Simon, if you dig into it, um, Simon is arguably, in my opinion, best translated as Reed. So I can't remember, but a number of Sundays ago, we talked about um, the, the passage that said, a bruised reed he will not break. Remember that? So a reed is a flimsy, weak little thing. Yeah? They used reeds to write with. They bound reeds together to make boats or roofs. Um, but, but a reed by itself is this puny little weak thing that's very easily broken. Yeah? So what Jesus is doing, and even this prophetic declaration that Jesus is so clearly making over Peter, is he's actually looking at him and, and saying, you are Simon. You are currently weak. You are currently breakable. You are currently uh, not strong, not confident, not secure. And I am going to take all of your brokenness. And I am going to birth the rock. But I love this Jesus because this is the Jesus who sees both the actualities and the possibilities. And you can't get to the possibilities without journeying through the actualities. In other words, you can't just get up and deny the fact that you're living where you're living. You actually have to come before God and say, oh, my Lord. I'm here. I've made a mess again. I'm wrecking my marriage. I'm wrecking my kids. I've destroyed you fill in the blank. I need you to come and fill me afresh to change me, to then help me journey through the actualities into the possibilities. Because this is the God that sees who you could be. And listen to me, this is the God that if you'll interact with him, not just once, but daily, and if you're willing to go to where he lives, go to where he's staying, then he will be taking you in this Jesus journey from where you are to the possibility of what he wants to make you into. It is so powerful. It's the gospel from Genesis to Revelation. This is the God who sees the possibilities. I read something that Michelangelo, you remember the sculptor? You probably read about it, Michelangelo the sculptor. Somebody had an interaction with him and he was uh, chiseling a block of marble and they said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to quote it. He said, um, I am releasing the angel imprisoned in this marble. Jesus is about releasing whatever you're currently in, the, 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 whatever you're currently stuck in. He is about releasing you into the possibility of what you can be. The question is, will you surrender your heart and life to him and let him shape you and make you and mold you? But if you will give him everything, not just part of it, if you will give him everything and continue to give him everything, he is the God that will make you from the broken reed to the rock. That's what he's about. He wants to fill you and call you deeper and call you higher and believe in you and bless you. The God who sees the actualities but moves through them into the possibilities. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> We're in verse 43. Jesus is about to call Philip and Nathaniel. So let's, let's go here. Verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. 
Finding Philip, he said, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. You can actually go there, by the way, on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Absolutely amazing. But verse 45, Philip found Nathanael. Isn't it fascinating how, like, the found guys, what do they go and do? Find more people? The found people go and find people. Go and tell them all. Remember those words? Every gospel ends with it in one way or another. Go and tell them all. Okay. All right. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. I mean, this is amazing. This is such transformational revelation that he's operating in and about whom the prophets also rose. So he's referencing Isaiah among others. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So now you have Nathanael. Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asks. And I love here what Philip says. Isn't this good? Come on. Let's look at it. So Philip comes and goes, come check out this guy. He's, he's the one who Moses told us about. He's the one the prophets told us about. He's the Messiah come to earth. He is the Savior of the world. Come and see him. He's the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel say? I'm going to fight with you. That's what Nathaniel says. Nazareth, can anything good come out of there? Some of you need to take notes on how to fight right here. Does he fight back? He says, come and see. It's an invitation into deeper relationship. There's something so powerful and rich there. It's not worth getting in an argument or fighting over what you think of Nazareth or anything else. But you can always invite someone deeper into the Jesus journey. And that's what he does here. Come and see. No argument. Verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Some, some translations say no guile. How do you know me? Nathanael asks. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under, still under the fig tree before Philip came to you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Let's pause there and then we'll come back and read those last two. Okay. Um, there's some uh, confusion over who the Messiah is going to be in this day and age. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of background because there's a similar confusion about who Jesus is today. It's really fascinating to me. But there's confusion in this moment over who Jesus is going to be because the prophets say he's going to be born in a little town called Bethlehem. But Jesus is raised in Nazareth. So there's, there's immediately confusion over is this guy the Messiah? Now, there's a, there's a second level of confusion to who the Messiah is going to be um, because what the, the, the Messiah that... Um, that Moses foretold about in Exodus, we've read some of that, and then the Messiah that David foretold um, was a Messiah who was a king, was successful, was powerful, um, was going to set up a new kingdom, okay? So everyone's expecting and waiting for a new King David, right? Then Isaiah comes along the scene, and Isaiah begins to talk about a suffering servant, and you get this flavor through Isaiah that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to have to suffer so that he can be glorified. He's going to have to experience death so that he can rise. And you begin to get these two like, things that seem um, uh, like, like they, they, they don't fit together. So you have a group of Jews who are waiting for this um, Davidic king, this guy who's going to come, this Messiah who's going to come and overthrow Rome and set up this powerful kingdom. And then you've got another group of people who are waiting for this suffering servant um, who's going to come and suffer. Now, what's fascinating is they're both right. Go with me. Hang on here. So, in other words, um, and, and I would actually even say uh, the same confusion exists today. In other words, Jesus um, had to experience the cross before he could experience the crown. He had to suffer before he could experience glory. So sometimes you'll go sit in a church and someone's going to tell you that you can be a son and a daughter and an heir and you can have all the goodness and every spiritual blessing coming from Jesus. And can you? Yes, that's true. They're right. 
But sometimes what they don't include is before that you can experience that resurrection life of Christ and the blessing of Christ Jesus and the favor of Christ Jesus and the goodness of Christ Jesus, you actually have to lay it all down. And Jesus said seven times when he preached the gospel, take up your cross and follow me. So before you can experience the crown, you have to actually lay it down and experience the suffering. Before you can um, experience the resurrection power of the garden tomb, if you will, I wish we could go to Jerusalem right now because I'd take you and I'd have you sit in the garden of Gethsemane. And the garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus settled, not my will, but your will. So first Jesus settles, not my will, but your will. Then he goes to Golgotha and dies, lays it all down. Then he goes to the garden tomb and breaks the power of death and hell and experiences the resurrection and gets the crown of life. But you see the order? So I have this huge problem when you get Christian pastors and teachers and people who want to preach this, hey, come and get all this great blessing. That's true. But listen to me. You will not experience the fullness of the blessing and the goodness of God unless you actually experience not my will, no longer Michael's will, but Jesus' will, and you lay it down and surrender. That's why you always hear me say, surrender your life to King Jesus. You can't just believe in Jesus. Do you know Satan believes in Jesus? Yeah. It's a, and obviously, you know, that's a semantic and we could wrestle that one, but it, it is the, the believing in Jesus has to be the laying down your own agenda, your own will, and your own way, and then the resurrection power of Jesus as you die, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, that's the words of Jesus in John, uh, you, you cannot experience life. So as you lay down your life in total surrender, then you're raised up with power and you get to experience the crown and the glory and the blessing. But listen to me care about it once you get here you just don't care and that's why he can trust you with every blessing under heaven because you're no longer jones and after that alone you want relationship with the king so nathaniel enters the scene here and you've got nathaniel who is saying what in the world about Nazareth, and there's, there's uh, some complexities here, and I'm not going to dig them all out if you look at the Greek, but I think essentially what Jesus is, is doing in this situation is Nathaniel is sitting under a fig tree, and it would, it would appear that he is probably actually thinking about and reflecting on the coming Messiah, okay? So when Jesus um, says, I saw you while you're still under the fig tree before Philip called you, and not only does he do that, he actually... Um, says who Nathanael is. Go back up to verse 47. Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. What is happening in those uh, sort of two scenes is that Jesus is looking into this guy's heart and mind and life, and he's actually calling out and calling forth what is currently happening. And all of a sudden, Nathanael's like, whoa, you are the Messiah. Look at this response. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. I mean, he calls it. Son of God is equated with God. You are God incarnate. That's what he's saying there. You are the King of Israel. Okay, now let's tie it up with these last two verses because there's something powerful here, and I hope we can get it. Verse 50, Jesus said, so he's talking to who? Nathaniel, that's right. Jesus said, you, Nathaniel, believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. In other words, I read your thoughts. You believe because I read what you were thinking. I told you what was going on inside of your heart. Therefore, you believe. Okay. And then Jesus says, you will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What in the world? So they're having a conversation. I see you under the fig tree. Jesus is reading what's going on in this guy's heart and mind. He's called it out in such a way and a deep, profound way that Nathaniel's like, oh my gosh, you are God. You are the son of God. Okay. And then Jesus goes into this. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, here's what uh, Nathaniel knew, but you and I might not know, is Jesus right here is referencing Genesis 28, 12. And I'm actually going to flip there. Genesis 28, if you want to flip there, if you want to make a note, do it. But let's read a couple passages here because there's something powerful. 
starting in verse 12, um, this is Jacob. So you had Abraham, um, and Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, one of whom is uh, Joseph. You may have heard about Joseph, but this is Jacob. And at this particular moment, um, J Jacob is actually in Canaan. He's in the promised land, but he doesn't know it's the promised land, okay? All right, so this is what happens. So uh, verse 12, he, um, Jacob, had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth. I always wondered if that's where Led Zeppelin got their song. That's just a Michael wondering. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Okay, so what do we have? We've got like a holy escalator, a holy stairway, right? Yeah? And what are the angels doing? Okay. And what did Jesus just say? You will, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Okay. So Nathaniel is obviously an educated, learned person. And so when Jesus is saying this, all the things are clicking inside of Nathaniel's mind. He's going click, click, click. Okay. So all of a sudden he's taken back to Genesis 28. There weren't chapters at that point, but he knows the story about Jacob and this dream Jacob had. So verse 13, back in Genesis 28, there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. So he's in the promised land, okay? This is pre-Exodus. This is pre the Israelites being stuck in slavery that we studied before John. Okay, verse 14. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. That's God's heart, by the way, for all Christians. It's another message for another day. Okay. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised. Verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. Some of you need to write that down right there. Surely the Lord was present in your life and you were not aware of it. Verse 17. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar. He poured oil on top of it, and he called the place Bethel. Though the city used to be called Luz. Okay, good enough. So let's flip back to John and see if I have it here. All right, so Jesus says, very truly I tell you, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So what Jesus is bringing um, full circle here um, is that uh, Jesus um, is the Son of Man. So uh, Jesus, in some ways, is this open portal to heaven, all right? So if Jesus is the Son of Man, and if over the Son of Man you see the angels of God doing what? Ascending and descending, going back and forth. So Jesus is the one on whom there is this uh, opening into heaven, whatever you want to call that, a stairway to heaven. And so when Jesus uh, goes to the grave, he's crucified on a cross, then he breaks the power of death and hell and he resurrects. And then you, you and I, in our lives, and Nathaniel, although he doesn't fully understand this at that moment, have this opportunity to have King Jesus come and live where? inside of us. Okay, now pause there just a second. All right, go back to King Jesus. So Jesus is walking the earth here, and Jesus is saying, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God, what? Ascending and descending on who? Jesus. That's right. He's saying, you will see the angels ascending and descending on me. I am the gateway to heaven. I am the door to Yahweh. Okay? Then he is crucified and he breaks the power of death and hell and then when you and i come on the scene we're able to surrender our lives to this king jesus and where then does he live by the way that's why i don't care if we meet in this building or rolling grice or somewhere else it doesn't matter the church is not the holy house of god you are if you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you, I've got good news for you. You are the holy house of God. So what Jesus is saying here to Nathaniel is, listen to me, man. There is coming a time and you're going to see angels ascending and descending over me. And then I'm going to open up this almost portal, this thing, where once you guys can surrender your lives to me, then where are the angels of God ascending and descending? Over me. 
and over you. See, this is the all power. This is what Paul's talking about. This is worth reading. Ephesians 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul writing, my favorite theologian, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That doesn't mean you're going to get a new Mercedes or a big house. You might. You might. You also might be called to make like Mother Teresa and go to India and lay it all down. But here's what he is promising, every spiritual blessing. In other words, he is saying, positionally, Nathaniel, positionally, you and I are actually in a spot where we are able to have the fullness of God dwelling inside of us and the angels of God ascending and descending over us. Every blessing in heaven and earth is now yours positionally. Go and live out of it. So in other words, go back to where we started this sermon in my prayer time when I first opened it. I am accepted in Christ. Say it. I am. <laughs> then we said, I am significant in Christ. Say that with me. <laughs> I am secure in Christ. Say that with me. <laughs> what I'm saying there and what I'm calling you all as a church into is to recognize that every spiritual blessing on heaven and on earth has been parked now inside of you. Stop walking around and hanging your head and being self-conscious and not confident and and oh, what is me? No, no, no. You have the very king and creator of the universe dwelling inside of you. Walk out and live out of that position of power. This is the best news you have ever heard. Now, if you struggle with insecurity or anxiety or depression, that, those are all real things, and I am not negating that for a moment. Don't hear me say that. But do begin to hear me say, take those things to Jesus and begin to trade your brokenness for every spiritual blessing that's been made available through the risen power of Christ Jesus. Is it a journey? Yes. yes. Is it going to all happen today? No. Positionally, though, is it all done today in this moment? Yes. Oh, that I could access more of it. What is the Jesus journey? It is accessing more of the angels of God ascending and descending, accessing more of the fullness of the Lord Jesus in your heart and life, and then beginning to walk and live out of that. It doesn't matter what X and so thinks of you or what somebody said to you or what they did to you because you're accepted in Christ. You're secure in Christ. You hear me? I'm telling you, church, if we could get this deep inside of us, what Jesus is telling Nathaniel, you believe because I read your life, but you're going to see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And that Son of Man is now available. If you will surrender your life to him and I will surrender my life to him, he will come and take up residence inside of you. And that power, all power in heaven and on earth comes and dwells inside of us. You could take this a hundred different ways as we wrap up. Michael, I can't beat alcoholism. Michael, I can't beat pornography. Michael, I can't beat my greed. Michael, I can't beat my, you fill, you fill in the blank, my depression. Michael, I get up every day and I'm so anxious and afraid I can't put one foot in front of the other. Listen to me. You begin to trade your brokenness daily. You, you, you hear me get up here a lot, and I'll say, I have this five-year journal, and I have these daily declarations. Now, listen to me here just a second. I have this, it's a sheet of paper like this. I'll bring it someday. And it's all busted and crinkly because I've been, I've been reading my daily declarations for years. But I have to remind myself that I'm accepted in Christ, that I'm significant in Christ, that I'm secure in Christ, that Michael's been crucified with Christ, that Michael doesn't live anymore, but Jesus now lives inside of me. So I get up in the morning, and I'm making coffee, and I'm standing there when nobody else is around, and I remind myself of this positional truth. Jesus has beat my anxiety. Jesus has beat whatever addiction I am facing. Jesus has overcome the sin in my life. Jesus has restored my marriage even if I don't see it. Jesus has restored my kids to me even if I don't see them home. Jesus has done, and you begin to live out of this positional reality. And I'm not saying be some kind of goofball idiot that, you know, declare. No, no, no. I'm actually saying live out of the reality of what he has already done. And you declare that over your heart and over your life. And you got to do it again and again and again. And you watch what King Jesus will do. And he will take the weak reed and he will make it a rock. Let's pray.
Worship team, would you come back up? Father, I am probably as aware of any time in my entire life about my desperate need for you. And I'm also more aware than I have been in my entire life that as I come and exchange my brokenness, that the very life of Christ is lived out in me and through me. And Father, I pray for this church. But I pray even for the capital C church, churches up and down this city, churches around this nation, that the old bondages of religion and performance would fall away and that we would experience rich and vibrant relationship with you. Father, I pray for this house. I pray for this group of people, Lord. I pray for the people in here that might be going, I, I can't do it. Father, I pray that you would seal on their hearts on this day that you love to take the bruised reed and make it a rock. That you're the God who the moment we look to you, you're the God who turns around and says, what do you want? Where are you? And you're the God that when we say we want to walk with you, we want to go to where you're staying, you're the God that invites us on that journey. Father, I pray that as we close in this song that you would seal something on our hearts perhaps that we've never seen or felt or known before. That is the resurrection power of this King Jesus. As we sing this closing song, I'd love to ask our prayer team to get up, maybe a few people up front, a few people back by the doors. I'm going to let them get in place here for a second just so you can see who they are. If you need special prayer, I'm going to be up here. If you've never given your life to this King Jesus, man, he'll change it. He'll take it all. And then he'll give you every spiritual blessing. If you need special prayer, go to one of these people. Do we have anybody over here? I guess not. We have a couple back here. That'll work. No, you're fine. Let's stand up as a congregation. If you're at home, I'd invite you into the same process with the Holy Spirit. Let him sift your heart and then let him call you deeper and further in your own journey. Let's worship the Lord in this closing song.